Thank you for inviting me. So the first thing I'm actually going to do is ask a rhetorical question. All right? What happens when you attempt to merge one of the most interdisciplinary, complex, secretive, and misunderstood professions with the world of global and science technology in a graduate academic setting? Well, the shorter answer is what you end up with is an incredibly unique environment that fosters diversity of thought, problem solving, and research output. But, and I say but with all capital letters, the same environment is ripe for what I would consider a true bell curve of results that range from the spectacular on the right-hand side of the curve all the way down to the less than stellar. So this world and environment does actually exist. It's in the School of Science and Technology Intelligence, which is actually a newer component of the National Intelligence University, or NIU. So NIU is actually operated and managed by the Defense Intelligence Agency. So we are Title 50, which is very different from what most people know in Title 10 world in this group. All right? We actually get our funding through what is literally known as the GDIP, so General Defense Intelligence Program. We are an accredited institution. It's actually been around for over 50 years. We've had lots of different names, right? And lots of different missions, okay? So what I want to explain today, or the focus of today's talk, is really based on a personal study that I actually initiated about a year ago with the help of two alumni. So Kim Roybush um, is from the FBI, and Maria Christina Hayden is actually a former DIA analyst that's currently with the Bank of New York Mellon as a vice president of, in their cyber threats division. Um, and the study, which is about to be published in the American Intelligence Journal, focused on why female students performed so well in this environment, and most importantly, what we can learn from that in a forum like this. OK, so that's my scene setter, all right? So I'm Dr. Brian Holmes. I'm actually the associate dean of the School of Science, Technology, and Intelligence. I've actually been on the faculty there since 2012. So like most good studies, it all started and was prompted by a very simple observation, right? And it was an observation I had about a year ago. So after spending about four years in the institution as a faculty member, teaching a lot of different, incredibly diverse section of students, I started noticing a trend. So in the fall, and this is actually happening right now as we speak, a full-time program at the School of Science, Technology, and Intelligence of students that are attempting to gain their masters is approximately 35 students in size, right? So not overly big. Only about seven or eight of those students, so less than one quarter, so a little bit closer to one-fifth or 20% are females. So my observation was after several years that just about every single year, the female students in our school gained some of the highest GPAs on a consistent fashion and sometimes the highest GPAs. So they're almost always in the top of the class. Additionally, those female students, the same ones, they're relatively small in population, would often win a significant number of our research awards. And so that in and of itself prompted a lot of different questions about why, despite being such a small sampling, these female graduate students did so well. So the first thing we concluded was many of these graduate female students were what we would kind of playfully term Renaissance women. And this is the reason why. So Leonardo da Vinci, the Italian polymath, is considered the quintessential Renaissance man example because he was adept in both the science and the arts. All right? So today's SNTI professionals, if you look very carefully at them, I would say a majority of them have a background in science and technology. They have STEM degrees. But it's actually not a universal rule. And that the same can be said with our graduate students in the program that we have. So a typical class in NIU in the School of SNTI is approximately 50% federal civilians and 50% military services, including the Coast Guard. Now, what's really interesting about the classroom to include the female students, is that when you look around, you'll be sitting next to someone who has an engineering background, an architecture background, a physics background, a specialist in political science, and another specialist in international relations. And many of them, certainly the federal, all come from every three little agency that you can imagine. 
So put all that in a room, and it's an incredibly complex environment. Very challenging, but very rewarding. Just to give you a little more feeling about our school, our faculty are bipolar. All right? So our provost likes to say, there's always this essential tension between the two missions of our faculty that have to teach these students. So one is they are graduate educators. So that's over here. But two is they're actually professional intelligence officers, which is over here. And those worlds are not exactly what we call seamless. Okay. Okay. So it's in a gender degree. So I talked about what the background of our students are. Just as importantly is what exactly does a science and technical intelligence professional do that relates so closely to what our program does in terms of its education? So you may have to learn things like weapons of mass destruction, emerging technologies, cyber threats. But the moment you walk in the door, even though you need to know the science and technology behind some issue, you're going to have to start learning policies, laws, histories of nations and groups, all kinds of unique context, that include even additional terms of art. Everyone here knows it's a term of art, right? Many of our customers do not have the same backgrounds that we do. In fact, if you're an STI analyst or professional, you have an incredibly steep mountain to climb because many of our customers do not have a science background. And even the few that do, for those, often have or understand different terms of art than we can present. So I might be a biologist, I'm not talking to a physicist. Imagine talking to a physicist in a room next to a poly scientist in a room. Again, what you end up finding is a good science and technical intelligence professional has to know the science and they have to be able and adept with what we would consider the social science world. All right? And we found our graduate female students, not only they do this, but they did this exceptionally well. So I'll give you two examples. Okay. So my two co-authors of a paper that's about to come out in the American Intelligence Journal. So Kim Roybush from the FBI. She came in from an organization called TDAC. She had a biology degree, and she was a forensics expert. But she made it her mission the moment she came to our school to learn about what's generally known as all-source intelligence analysis. If you actually dig deep into all-source intelligence analysis, most of the methodologies and techniques are actually based on social science methods. Okay? It's very qualitative. Now, in Maria Hayden's case, she came in and graduated from a program at Georgetown. It was actually an international relations degree. But the program itself actually centered around the impact of global science technology in international relations. So this piqued her interest in science technology. And what was fascinating was she became one of the first undergraduates in Georgetown from this program who gained a DOD smart scholarship. Okay? And so that smart scholarship, plus that degree, it was a social science degree, but had underpinnings in context around science technology, ended up having a huge impact on her future career and then subsequent attainment into our degree program. And what she did when she came to us was she immediately dipped her hand into both the science and technical world and the social science world, and she did it well. Now, both students completed what was generally called a mixed methodology research design. So scientists are kind of laugh at this. No scientist will spend an entire chapter of a thesis writing about a methodology. It's assumed as you're a scientist that you apply what? The scientific method. I don't need to spend a chapter telling you that. It's the most universally well-known method there is. But when you go into the social sciences, you may actually gain, as part of your degree, a class and in information on research design and methodology. It's a standard thing that happens. All right? And so what happens with a mixed method research design, it's one of the hardest to do, but it can have the greatest results. So mixed method is when you integrate the data and methods between a quantitative type of research, research collection and analysis and a qualitative. It is very tricky, and it's hard to integrate the two techniques. Both of these students actually did it, and they did it well for their thesis, and both won awards. Okay. So even though I just communicated that universally speaking, it's not a hard rule that many of our students and many in the profession of SNTI have a background in STEM. The simple fact is a majority do. 
And so one of the next steps in our study was actually try to determine what kind of cultural factors may have affected this female graduate students on their rise up to our school, possibly in our school, and then subsequently after they left our school and continued with their profession. So a couple of years ago, I think it was a year or two ago, the University of Washington came out with a great study. All right? um, and they talked about different trends <clears throat> that affected why women went into certain STEM fields or not. And they came up with three conclusions. So the first was there's a lack of pre-college experience in STEM. We heard earlier from the Army folks, right, that it's, this one's all about access, right? At what age do you have access to, to some unique either program, like in high school or earlier, or even something that piques your interest? So there's a problem there. Second, gender gaps in belief in one's ability. And third, a masculine culture discourages women from participating. If you have ever been in the intelligence community, and if you've ever been in science and technical intelligence, I'll tell you right now, nine times out of 10, when you sit in a meeting, it is dominated by men, all right? So when I asked the female, so Maria, my co-authors, Kim, and several other current students and alumni, if any of this actually resonated, regardless of whether you have a STEM degree or not, the answer was yes. And so we immediately asked them, what did you do to try to overcome some of these barriers that, again, made you so successful in this kind of program? And I'll go through that. So first, if you actually open up our catalog, nowhere in there will you see a listing that says you must solve world peace with your thesis, although many try, all right? So for many students, you want to come in, you want to gain, take your classes, you want to pass, you want to do your thesis, and then you hope to graduate and move on. But what we found with many of these female students is they aggressively wanted to have a significant amount of impact. And our impact can be very high levels. So the highest levels of national security, think about that. This is where some of the theses and the output can go. Many of our theses are highly classified, okay? So they are very aggressive in what they are doing. And what we found is rarely do they perform research what we call for the sake of research. So once they figured out their research question, once they figured out what their objective was, they pursued it very aggressively. That is not a universal trait with the female students, but I would suggest a higher percentage of them did it versus the males. That's not to say the males did a bad job, right? So more often than not, I said <clears throat> before that Maria and Kim actually applied a mixed method research design. So that is not a universal design within our university or school. More often than not, you're going to apply more of a qualitative design. And the simple fact is, in our school, if you want to do bench chemistry or some unique technical research, we actually have to leverage the rest of the intelligence community, as well as the DOD labs, to exploit their capabilities. And to do that, we have to do what I always call the stars must align. We have to go up to those researchers and scientists and say, hi, I'm here to help you. And oh, by the way, it's for my thesis. Can I use your lab instrumentation? Can I use your expertise? And then maybe we can get something very fruitful out of this that helps both of us out. And so the female students would do that, and they do it very well. And a significantly high percentage would do it. Now, one of the reasons before I talked about the gender-based quality, <clears throat> another trait we found is to do that requires an enormous amount of outreach. All right? Part of outreach, I would suggest, is being a good communicator. Some people are good at outreach and some people are not. Okay? To do outreach, to sometimes cold call some random person, some squirrely lab that I've never heard about, you have to be aggressive in it. You have to communicate. You have to enable. You have to follow guidance and advice from the people around you, including your chairs for your thesis. But what we found is many of these students did it, and they did it well. Okay. <clears throat> and one of the hardest parts I've ever seen, and this is where, again, it gets pretty tricky, is you have to blend what I call the best practices of academic theory with the intelligence practice. They are different. Okay? What you'll find is intelligence, particularly in the final, final products. Intelligence is implicit. Right? They're never going to show you how they did something or how the sausage was made. They don't. They say, this is my product. Take it. Learn from it. There you go. I'm going to move on. 
Whereas in the scientific world, we want to document every detail of what we do. Why? Because that's rigorous, and you want someone to validate it. Your research isn't real until someone else comes along and they duplicate it, right? You want that credibility and that validation. Well, believe it or not, that is not exactly something that always occurs in the intelligence community. And so you have to do this in a very unique way in our institution. Okay, so women weigh in. So I talked before about some of the cultural barriers. So most of the women, what they would say is, we're not trying to be competitive, right? But instead, it was really personal pride, right? So if in a room, even a classroom, a professional setting, in which there's a lot of men, most of it was personal pride to gain credibility. How do you get your voice to be heard at the table? And how do you get a receptive offense to listen and to prove you're capable and credible? I will tell you right now, in the intelligence community, you could be the greatest superstar in the world that comes from, I'll name it, Stanford, MIT, but everything in the intelligence community is personal in nature. I do not trust you, no matter how big your resume is, until I get to know you and you give me something of use. That's how we operate. And so if you want that other person to think about you in a credible manner, these are the kind of traits you have to have. Okay, so in conclusion, a lot of different discussion about communication, all right? So one of the best reasons why we have essentially what are called or described as Renaissance women and why they do so well is because they are very good at communicating. Often they'll tell you they're better communicators than the men, all right? And in fact, that's what they do. And here's what happens in intelligence. So in intelligence, you may describe, we always call the science and technical part a capability. Right? But if you don't contextualize it and communicate it, use things like visuals in an effective manner, while also applying all the standards and regulations that we have within that community, you have just failed in your profession. And so these graduate students, particularly the females, do this and they do it well. So if you want to learn how to be a better communicator, how to produce great research, how to do things in a very diverse and inclusive manner and have great output, Look no further than the Renaissance Women in the School of SNTI. Thank you very much. Thank you.